What's good, Bills Mafia? Rev here, and you are now tuned in to episode 8 of Rated Rev, right here on the Buffalo Fanatics Network. If you are still not plugged into the Buffalo Fanatics Network, do me this favor, will you? Like, comment, and subscribe to the channel with all bell notifications on so you can stay up to date with all things Buffalo Bills. Now let's dig in. Grace and peace to you, my brothers and sisters. I hope that you guys are having a fantastic start to your work week. And I pray that to all of the mothers out here, you all had a blessed and happy Mother's Day weekend. Just know that you are much appreciated. But listen, to everybody who's joining me right now, I would like to welcome you to another edition of Rated Rev brought to you by the Buffalo Fanatics Network. Look, it's been a few weeks, matter of fact, since we last spent time together on Rated Rev. So I'm excited as ever to dive into today's discussion. And with that being said, let's get into some news around the NFL. Former Bills 2011 first round pick Marcel Darius is attempting a comeback with the Baltimore Ravens. According to Ravens head coach John Harbaugh, the former two-time Pro Bowler and one-time All-Pro defensive tackle was invited to try out at the Ravens rookie minicamp. Now, although Darius hasn't had the career arc he'd like, I'm sure this is an opportunity for him to prove to the Ravens and the rest of the league that he still has something to offer teams despite being out of the NFL since 2019. The Las Vegas Raiders interim team president Dan Ventrell is no longer with the organization, alleging he was fired for reporting hostile work environment as published by NFL.com on Friday. Ventral told the Las Vegas Review Journal on Friday afternoon that he was fired in retaliation for him alerting the NFL that owner Mark Davis ignored concerns that there was a hostile work environment within the organization. When Ventral confronted Davis, Ventral said the following, he did not demonstrate the warranted level of concern. Given this, I informed the NFL of these issues and of Mark's unacceptable responses. Soon thereafter, I was fired in retaliation for raising these concerns. Ventral later stated, I firmly stand by the decision to elevate these issues to protect the organization and its female employees. The NFL announced their international slate of games to include three London games, a Monday night football in Mexico City, and the first ever game in Germany. The London matchups kick off in week four, October the 2nd, between the Minnesota Vikings and the New Orleans Saints. Week five will feature the New York Giants versus the Green Bay Packers, and the London games will end with the week eight matchup between the Denver Broncos and the Jacksonville Jaguars. All games will be played at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Now, the NFL's first ever game in Germany will take place during week 10 at Alliance Arena, which is the home stadium of FC Bayern Munich, featuring the Tom Brady-led Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the Russell Wilson-less Seattle Seahawks. The international slate concludes with a week 11 Monday night football matchup between the Arizona Cardinals and the San Francisco 49ers in Mexico City. Dallas, Texas Mayor Eric Johnson wants the city to get a second NFL team. On Thursday, the NFL on CBS Twitter account asked which city was the most deserving of an NFL expansion team. And Mayor Eric Johnson had this to say in a series of tweets. He said, and I quote, the answer is Dallas. Why? We are about to pass the Chicago Metro and become the number three Metro in the U.S., which would make us the largest U.S. Metro without two teams. Football is king here. Dallas needs an expansion team, and we would be able to sustain two NFL teams, watch this, better than L.A. or New York. 
It seems like Mayor Eric Johnson is starting a fire in Dallas. And we will see at some point in time whether or not the NFL decides to award Dallas with a second NFL franchise. Well, that'll do it for another edition of news around the NFL. So let's dive in to the rest of the show. Now that the NFL draft is in the rearview mirror and we've had a week to digest it as we inevitably look ahead to the AFC playoff race, I want to do some team scouting throughout the conference to determine which teams have gotten better and which teams have gotten worse, starting with none other than the AFC East, baby. All right, so let's kick things off with the New York Jets. The Jets finished last place in the division with a 4-13 and record. So it's safe to say that they approached the offseason with needs at almost every position imaginable outside of the quarterback position. But the good news is that they had a ton of cap space and nine draft picks to improve their roster. So how did they do? How did the New York Jets do in the offseason? Well, let's start off with free agency before we get into the draft. Okay. In free agency, they signed guard Lakin Tomlinson to a three year, $40 million contract. They then signed wide receiver Braxton Berrios to a two year, $12 million contract. They then signed running back Tevin Coleman to a one year, $1.5 million deal. They signed tight end CJ, excuse me, Uzoma from the Bengals to a three-year, $24 million deal. Signed cornerback DJ Reed to a three-year, $33 million deal. Signed safety Jordan Whitehead to a two-year, $14.5 million contract. And then they signed defensive tackle Solomon Thomas to a one-year contract who has familiarity with the system and playing under head coach Robert Sala in San Francisco. So it's clear, right? When you look at what the Jets were trying to do, it's clear that they were trying to add and fill needs in free agency. And they had the money to spend, but they did it wisely. They didn't just splurge and, and, and make ridiculous signings. They were, very, they were very calculated in the moves that they made in free agency. You look at the needs that they had, well, they actually filled them. They had a need on the offensive line, so they added a very good guard in Lakin Tomlinson by signing him to a three-year deal. They loved what they saw in wide receiver Braxton Barrows out of the slot and who provided a uh, special teams value, so they brought him back on a two-year deal. They added depth at the running back position by bringing Tevin Coleman along. Then they added uh, potential starters in the secondary in cornerback DJ Reed and safety Jordan Whitehead, all while adding to the defensive line, which was already good, by bringing in Solomon Thomas. So the Jets did a very good job of filling needs throughout free agency. But now let's take a look at what they did in the NFL draft, who many would say that they had the best draft of every or any team uh, uh, this season. They had two picks in the first round, and they ended up with three. Let's look at it. Their first pick in the first round, number four, they selected cornerback Sauce Gardner. The second first round pick, number 10 overall, they selected wide receiver Garrett Wilson from Ohio State. Then this is where it got really interesting. They traded up into round one at pick number 26 and selected defensive end from Florida State, Jermaine Johnson, the second, who many thought would be projected to be picked within uh, picks 10 to 15 in that range. And they happened to get him all the way at 26. My gosh. Think about who they already have on that defensive line, and they add a guy like Jermaine Johnson in the bottom of round one to go along with Carl Lawson, who they be returning from an Achilles injury. That defensive line is going to be very good. And then in round two, this is where myself and others got kind of upset. Well, not kind of. We got pretty upset at what they did. They traded up with the New York Giants to pick number 36 and selected running back Brees Hall to go along with Michael Carter from last year. And then in round three, they selected another tight end, Jeremy Ruckert. So when you look at the Jets' overall depth chart so far, uh, this is what they're saying 
is their current depth chart. I guess I guess what you could say their projected depth chart. Okay, obviously at quarterback you, you've got Zach Wilson, and then followed by uh, a backup quarterback Joe Flacco. Running backs they have Brees Hall and Michael Carter. With depth option at Tevin Coleman. All right. At the wide receiver position, they have Elijah Moore, Corey Davis, who many probably forgot about, Garrett Wilson, and Braxton Berrios, along with Denzel Mims, DJ Montgomery, and others. Okay. Tight end position CJ Uzoma, Tyler Conklin, and the rookie Jeremy Ruckert. Now, along the offensive line, from left to right, they've got George. They got George Fant at left tackle, Lakin Tomlinson at left guard, Connor McGovern at center, Elijah Vera Tucker at right guard, and Makai Becton, who they who they are projecting to make a switch to right tackle. Okay, and that's just on the offensive side of the ball. Defensive line, you've got Quinton Williams, Sheldon Rankins, Carl Lawson, uh, uh, and then you've got uh, Jermaine Johnson. Oh, my gosh. In addition to who they just picked up in Solomon Thomas. Wow. Unbelievable. Linebacker, they got C.J. Mosley, uh, Quincy Williams, Jamie Sherwood, uh, with backups in Hamza Nasruddin from last year. And then at cornerback, they got Sauce Garner and D.J. Reed. Wow. With at the safety position, okay, at the safety position, they've got Jordan Whitehead, LaMarcus Joyner, with backups, Jason Pinnock in depth at Will Parks. So, overall, the Jets have done a very, very uh, good job in free agency and in the draft. So now, as we project the New York Jets, and we're trying to see how they did in this offseason, did what they did in the offseason make them better, or did it make them worse? Well, in my opinion, guys, after factoring in um, the young talent that was already on the team prior to free agency and the draft, then you add their free agent signings and their ridiculously good draft. It's For me, it's, it's hard to say that they did not get markedly better all across the board. New York Jets, kudos to you. Next up, we have the Miami Dolphins. Now, despite the chaos that was surrounding the Dolphins from former head coach Brian Flores to the, to the questionable decisions regarding Tua, they somehow still managed to finish 2021 with a winning record at 9-8. and eight. Now, make no mistake about it, though. The Miami Dolphins were a team with plenty of talent heading into the 2022 offseason. But did the moves that the Miami Dolphins made make them better or worse? Let's look at free agency. Now, Miami Dolphins in free agency franchise tag tight end Mike Gusecki, whom I personally loved and was waiting for him uh, to be let go or not to be re-signed back with the Dolphins because I've loved Mike Gusecki for a very long time. So the fact that they tagged him um, is a good thing because he's a very good tight end. They signed, this is the biggest signing that they had um, all free agency, was a signed offensive tackle, Teron Armstead, to a five-year, $87.5 million contract. That was a huge addition, a huge addition uh, to the NFL's worst pass-blocking unit in 2021. Um, so I like what they did there. Um, they then signed running back Raheem Mostert to a one-year, $3 million deal. They signed running back Chase Edmonds, a very good running back, to a two-year, $12.6 million deal. And they signed former Cowboys wide receiver Cedric Wilson to a three-year, $22.8 million contract. They signed quarterback Teddy Bridgewater to be the backup quarterback to Tua so far. We'll see. Uh, to a one-year deal. And they re-signed defensive end Emmanuel Ogba to a four-year, $65 million deal, who I think the Buffalo Bills had on their radar had they weren't able to make a certain move that they did, which I'll get into later on. 
Then they later signed guard Connor Williams to a two-year $14 million contract and re-signed wide receiver Preston Williams to a one-year $2 million deal. Now, the biggest move, not necessarily a move in free agency, right, to sign a player, but what they did was they traded, it was a blockbuster trade for wide receiver Tyreek Hill in exchange for 2022 first round pick, second round pick, and a fourth round pick, and a 2023 fourth round and sixth round pick. And they also signed him to a monster, mega, four-year, $120 million contract extension. Tyreek Hill going from Kansas City to sunny South Beach, Miami, Florida. We'll see how he improves that team. But now moving on from free agency into the draft. Well, I mean, (laughs) let's take a look at what they did in the draft. Round three is where they started. Why? Because they traded their first and second round picks to the Kansas City Chiefs for Tyreek Hill. And with their first pick in the third round, they selected linebacker Channing Tindall. Then in round four, they selected wide receiver Eric Uzukama, who Kevin Garrard, shout out my man, did not like that pick one bit. And then they had two seventh round picks to close out the draft by getting linebacker Cameron Good and quarterback Skylar Thompson. So now, (laughs) I mean, I don't know what you could say about that draft. I mean, I mean, what could I mean? What could you expect, right? I mean, so let's 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 just look. Let's look before we before we um, analyze the moves that they made and determine whether or not they've gotten better or worse. Let's look at the projected depth chart so far. Okay, so so far, um, the projected depth depth chart is as follows: quarterbacks they've got Tua Tungavaloa and Teddy Bridgewater. Right as a top two, and then Skylar Thompson as a three. Running backs have got Chase Edmonds, Raheem Mostert, followed by Miles Gaskin. Fullback they got Alec Ingold, who they signed in free agency. All right, and then wide receiver they've got talent, guys. Don't, don't make no mistake about it. They've got talent. They got Tyree Kill, Jalen Waddle, Cedric Wilson, who they just signed, Lynn Bowden, and then Eric Ezukama, the the rookie, Trent Sherfield, who they signed in free agency, and then Preston Williams. Okay. Oh, and in case you're, you're you're wondering what happened to Devontae Parker, they traded him to the uh, New England Patriots, who we'll talk about shortly as well. So now, better or worse? Did the Miami Dolphins get better or worse? And we're just looking at the offense there when I went through the depth chart. Now, while the blockbuster trade for Tyreek Hill uh, looks good on the surface, because it looks very good on the surface, right? I wonder if they paid too much for a premium player while they still have many questions surrounding the quarterback position beyond 2022. Not many people think that Tua is going to be the long-term option at quarterback. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. But does that warrant when you have question marks at the most important position of the team, does that warrant Spending such a high premium for a wide receiver when you could have essentially added younger, cheaper talent, right? Without foregoing those high draft picks? I don't know, right? I don't know. We'll see soon enough. But their draft, I mean, in my opinion, the draft was not good at all, right? I mean, it just it really, it really wasn't good at all. Um, but I mean, what, like I said earlier, I mean, what can you expect? I mean, they, they gave away three of the top four picks uh, to Kansas City um, and more to land Tyreek Hill. Now, I do, however, like the addition of Teron Armstead to the offensive line, and I like Chase Edmonds because I believe he's a solid uh, dual threat running back. But now I will say, I will say that um, I think they did get slightly better. They got slightly better on paper. Um, But this team, though, will only go as far as Tua will take them. Number three on the list is the New England Patriots. Now, after starting the season last year at two and four, and many people were ready to write them off, they somehow managed to string together a seven-game win streak that put them in first place 
of the AFC East. Now, we know what happened. Even though we were stressing out, biting our fingernails, wondering how the Bills were going to be able to climb back into the division and, and, and beat the Patriots, the Patriots finished in the final four games of the season with a record of 1-3, and three, losing the division to the Buffalo Bills, who they ultimately played in the wild card round of the playoffs, getting absolutely obliterated to the tune of 47-17 in the infamous Bills no-punt game. Now, with their future, I guess you can say somewhat secure in rookie Pro Bowl franchise quarterback, Mac Jones, got to give it to him. Let's see if the Patriots did enough this offseason to overtake the two-time division-winning Buffalo Bills or if they got worse. So, let's look at free agency. What did the New England Patriots do in free agency, you might ask. Well, for one, they released their offense, their, their outside linebacker, Kyle Van Noy. They re-signed uh, special teams ace Matthew Slater. Re-signed running back James White to a two-year contract. They signed running back Ty Montgomery to a two-year contract. They, they, they love running backs. I, I don't know. They still got Damon Harris on the team. They love running backs. They acquired linebacker Mac Wilson from the Cleveland Browns in exchange for defensive lineman Chase Winovich, who they who they selected in the third round uh, a couple of years ago. Then one of the most buffoonery moves in free agency that they made was they traded their starting guard Shaq Mason to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for chump change. I mean, literally, jump chains in exchange for a fifth-round pick. A fifth-round pick for their starting offensive guard. And they brought back offensive tackle Trent Brown on a two-year deal. They brought back Malcolm Butler on a two-year contract. They signed safety Devin McCourty on a one-year deal. Signed Jabril Peppers safety on a one-year deal. And then they traded their fifth-round pick to Houston for their sixth and seventh round picks in the 2022 NFL draft. It, it doesn't make any sense. Okay. And then they, they then they did, did something. They did something. Which is kind of, I don't know, take it for what it, what it, what it is. They traded for wide receiver Devonte Parker from the Miami dolphins and his 2022 fifth round pick um, in exchange for a 2023 third round pick. So needless to say, their free agency was weird. And on top of that, Matthew Juno on their defensive line, uh, the defensive end, was like trying so hard, trying so hard to recruit free agents to come to New England. And they were like, nah, fam, I ain't going over there. <laughs> I loved every bit of it. I loved every bit of it because they were trying hard to get players and they did not want to come. Why? Because they don't have Tom Brady. They ain't got Tom Brady. The quicker you guys realize that, the better off you'll be. But now, let's move on now, past the free agency time, now into the draft. This is where it gets fun. If you thought free agency for the Patriots was funny, oh my gosh. <laughs> Wait until you hear what happened in the draft. In round one, oh my gosh, the New England Patriots, they, at pick number 29, they selected guard Cole Strange. Don't worry, I'm going to talk about it here in a second. In the second round of pick number 50, they drafted wide receiver Tyquan Thornton. Then in the third round, they picked cornerback Marcus Jones. And then they had three fourth round draft picks in which they selected cornerback Jack Jones, another running back, Pierre Strong, and then a quarterback, Bailey Zappi. Now, the New England Patriots arguably had one of the most bizarre off seasons in a long time. And not only, listen, not only did they trade their starting guard, Shaq Mason, like I mentioned earlier, to the Bucks for a measly fifth round pick, they entered the draft and went cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. I mean, they went nuts. I don't know what Bill Belichick was thinking. 
We thought Mike Mayock during his tenure with the Ra- with the Raiders was bad. Bill Belichick, I think, was sitting there was like, yo, hold my beer. Let me one up this guy. <laughs> Let me one up him. And in round one, they went with guard Cole Strange, who could have gone significantly later in the draft. I mean, when they selected Cole Strange, it was so strange, pun intended, <laughs> That Rams head coach Sean McVay poked fun at it, saying that they wasted their time looking into Cole Strange, who they expected to be available when they were on the clock, which happened to be in the third round at pick 104. But Bill Belichick was like, nah, fam, I'm going to select this guy in the first round at pick number 29 because I think that there's some teams who want to get him earlier. <laughs> Oh, my gosh, I love every bit of it, every bit of it. Now, if that wasn't enough, Bill Belichick decided to draft a speedy wide receiver, Tyquan Thornton, at pick 50, who also was slated to go much later in the draft. Now, this is where it gets kind of interesting because, now, it's one thing to hear from a Bills fan, right? But it's another thing to hear from somebody who actually covers the New England Patriots. All right, now, according to Pat's pulpit senior writer, Rich Hill, the New England Patriots finished with the number one in Tyquan Thornton, the number five in Cole Strange, and number 15 uh, uh, in Jack Jones. Biggest reaches in the entire NFL draft comparing actual pick versus consensus pick rank. Did you hear that? They, they had the number one the number five, and the number 15 biggest reaches in the draft. Okay, so now, let's let's just not waste any more time. Let's not waste any more time. Did the New England Patriots get better or worse this offseason? When you look at all the moves that they did in free agency and in the draft, did they get better or worse? Is that even a question? They got 10,000 times worse. I don't know what Bill Belichick was thinking. I don't know if age is getting to him or maybe he's just getting so prideful and arrogant that he thinks that because, you know, he's won so many Super Bowls, he can do whatever he wants to do and it's just going to work. I got news for you, Bill. Unless Tom Brady's walking back to that team, you ain't going nowhere. Except maybe the deuces. (laughs) Because I think Robert Kraft is about to, he's getting really close He's going to give you some time to see whether or not this draft is going to work itself out. But man, oh man, I think it's fair to say that Bill Belichick could be sitting on a hot seat if things don't work out this year. Now, let's move on. Lastly, but certainly not least, the Buffalo Bills. We have the two-time AFC division champion Buffalo Bills entering the conversation, baby. Now, they entered last year with very minimal, very minimal needs. Um, But there was one glaring hole that a lot of people saw, a lot of people knew about it, right? And that was the cornerback two position opposite of Trey White who ended the year with a torn ACL, okay? So Trey White left uh, on Thanksgiving with the torn ACL, we had to have Levi Wallace and Dane Jackson start in spot duty until right until the end of the year. We know what happened in free agency. We got rid of Levi Wallace, or we let him walk, and he gets and he signed with the the, the Pittsburgh Steelers. So now that left a huge void at cornerback with only Dane Jackson and a bunch of other guys, Cam Lewis and other guys. Right now, Bean, we also know that. He was strapped for cap entering free agency, okay? And he had to work his magic in an effort to improve this team and finally get the Bills over the hump and into the Super Bowl. So let's look at what Brandon Bean, big baller Bean, did in free agency to improve this team. All right, we know what happened. Release linebacker A.J. Klein. Released offensive lineman John Feliciano. Released defensive tackle Starla Tulele. Released wide receiver Cole Beasley. Now you say, man, he released a lot of players. Yes, but look at what he did. Resigned Isaiah McKenzie. 
signed guard Roger Saffold, signed defensive tackle Tim Settle and defensive tackle Daquan Jones, signed tight end O.J. Howard, and the monster signing, the mega signing of free agency. He landed the big fish, the big dog, defensive end Von Miller, pulling him away from the comforts of Los Angeles, off of fresh off of a Super Bowl victory, brought him to Buffalo, who he wanted to play with, Josh Allen. Then he added quarterback Case Keenum to be the backup, brought back Matt Barkley, signed wide receiver Jamison Crowder, signed Ryan Bates, brought back Jordan Phillips and Shaq Lawson, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Brandon Bean did his thing in free agency for a club that was strapped for cap. It doesn't matter because Brandon Bean is that dog. He knows what he's doing, and he added quality, quality, quality uh, talent to an already loaded team, Super Bowl caliber team, Buffalo Bills, in free agency alone. But now what did he do in the draft? Well, you know, the Buffalo Bills had the 25th overall pick in the NFL draft. And they ultimately traded up to the 23rd pick in the NFL draft. And in round one, they selected their cornerback, Kyir Elam, out of Florida. They added the cornerback to opposite Tredavious White, who many were calling for. Because remember, Brandon Bean had that invested a high draft pick in a cornerback since drafting Tredavious White. He's 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 gotten along. He's gotten by with... Uh, uh, undrafted free agent Levi Wallace and seventh round draft pick Dane Jackson. But now he invested high capital round one money, round one investment in cornerback Kyir Elam to pair with Tredavious White. But now we know that he's going to be playing with likely uh, Dane Jackson until Tredavious White gets back healthy. But we still don't know. Maybe Trey is ready at the beginning of the season. We don't know. We'll see. But he filled a huge need in the draft with his first pick. Then in round two of the draft, at pick number 63, he selected running back James Cook. Now we know that Brandon Bean tipped his hand in free agency by going after J.D. McKissick, who ultimately did a right and went back to Washington. J.D. McKissick was at receiving back, so we know that that's the kind of back that they were looking for. They added Duke Johnson as a veteran guy, but they wanted to get, improve that, that position, right? So they got James Cook, who is arguably the best receiving back in this class, who runs a sub-4-440, brother of Dalvin Cook, in case you didn't know. Then in round three, they got a linebacker by the name of Terrell Bernard, and then in round five, one of the, one of, one of the best picks that – that not just I think, but but a lot of the uh, the, the the NFL community um, is commending Brandon Bean for making is in the fifth round they traded up for wide receiver Khalil Shakir, who man I think has incredible talent. Reminds me a lot of Robert Woods, but when you pair him with Stephon Diggs, Gabe Davis, Isaiah McKenzie, Jamison Crowder, Khalil Shakir, I mean come on now, I mean just the rich getting richer. Up in this camp, right? And then round six, they got my man, who they call AKA the punt god, punter Matt Areza. So now, and of course they, they selected other guys too, but these are the guys that I really wanted, wanted to focus on. So when you look at the Buffalo Bills, all right, this team was already loaded, already loaded, right? Two years ago, AFC Championship game. Last year, division around playoffs, lost. About 13 seconds. Lost in 13 seconds, right? And a coin flip. Many people were saying, if the Bills would have beaten the Chiefs, nobody wanted to see them in the playoffs. And they were likely going to go to the Super Bowl and win. That's how good this team was, despite the holes that they had. But now you enter this offseason and they make these additions, these very strategic additions, and they add these players. Von Miller to the defense. Oh, my gosh. They add Kyer Elam in the draft. They 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 fortify the defensive line by getting Tim Settle and Daquan Jones. 
They add more players on offense and, and, and tight end OJ Howard along with Duke Johnson. Then they draft uh, James Cook. I mean, these guys made moves after move after move after move, including re-signing their own players in Ryan Bates and Ike Botker to provide depth along the offensive line. But we know that Ryan Bates is likely going to compete for a starting job, if not have it in the hole already. So now, when we look at the Buffalo Bills, did the Buffalo Bills, <laughs> I can't believe I'm even asking, asking this question. Did the Buffalo Bills get better or worse this offseason? You tell me, Mafia. What do you think? Let me know in the chat. But look, I, I'm a, look, we already know the answer to that question, right? The Buffalo Bills, baby, got 10,000 times better. And yo, let me say this. To everybody in the AFC, you better look out for the Buffalo Bills this year. Everybody was making moves to chase the Bills. To chase the Bills. They were making these moves to try to catch up to the Bills. I know what you're saying. The Bengals were the, were the AFC uh, uh, Super Bowl runner-ups. I get it. The Chiefs were in the championship game. I get it. But we all know. We all know who arguably was the best team in the AFC last year. It's the Buffalo Bills. And we also know which team other AFC teams fear. And that is the Buffalo Bills, who just got a whole lot better. That concludes another edition of Rated Rev brought to you by the Buffalo Fanatics. Yo, I hope you had as much fun talking about this as I did and I can't wait to join you guys again for another edition of Rated Rev next week, next Monday at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But that is my time. And as always, and until next time, y'all, grace and peace. God bless and go big.